it's terrific to be here and uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. How do we participate in a meaningful way? Uh, and I just want to acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Bunwarung people. And as I sit here talking to you, I'm looking out at Western Port Harbour. And I just want to acknowledge also that I'm an uninvited guest uh, on this land that's never been ceded. Uh, where sovereignty's never been ceded. I moved here from Aotearoa in New Zealand uh, seven years ago, so I'm still learning, always learning. Um, and I know that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. A uh, little bit about me. Uh, this is in my younger days. Uh, I've got a nursing background, and this is me with babies. Amazing how they're good at finding your boobs. Uh, and I'm also very, very interested in um, the virtual space, which is lucky, really, because we've certainly got a lot of it, and uh, particularly around data and health and digital technologies. Um, the lens with which I am kind of going to situate this talk is through health literacy or science literacy, cultural safety, and um, how that relates to consumer participation or community participation or citizen science. Uh, and also just really want to acknowledge um, what a tough time it is, especially for people in Victoria. And uh, that uh, I think what we're learning is just how difficult it is um, uh, in terms of the virtual and how uh, there are many things that cannot be replaced uh, in a virtual space, like the park, for example. And uh, I'm particularly interested in how COVID-19, uh, Black Lives Matter, have kind of intersected at this time to make race something that uh, a lot of people were not really aware of. And it's obviously, being a person of colour, it's something I can never escape from. So um, I guess what I'm trying to do is just really position myself uh, and talk about reflexivity, which is something that's going to be quite a significant part of this talk. Um, one of the other things that also ha happened uh, during this period that we've been in uh, social isolation or physical isolation, um, some of you will remember the incident of the man who was birding while black in Central Park and who got challenged. And um, challenged by a woman who had let her dog free in an area that was um, especially for birders and, and uh, when challenged uh, started accusing the man uh, who had told her that it was a bird area only uh, that he was attacking her and she would report him to police and uh, as he was filming we could see that actually he posed no threat to her but I think um, why this example is so relevant to what I'm going to say is um, I think it's really important to think about who's allowed to be in what spaces, whose knowledges count and when they count, uh, and who's allowed to hold the power and set the terms of engagement. So that's something I'd really like you to think about. Um, these are some frogs from the Australian Museum and how, how fabulous that they're a sponsor. That was a spooky coincidence. Um, so I've got two questions and one is how can we open up the space of citizen science for all? And I guess I'm thinking very much of how Alice Motion started um, our gathering today when she asked us about, um, you know, who does it include? How diverse is our is citizen science and diversity in, in the broader sense, not just ethnicity. But I'm probably going to talk a lot about culture and ethnicity today. And um, I'm also thinking very much of Stuart's talk, which was really awesome today. How do we act in solidarity within the unequal power relations that keep many people apart from places we are authorised to work in? So I'm thinking about borders and boundaries um, very much. So I'm just going to leave this up for you to have a quick read. So I, I think um, this morning, this, sorry, not this morning, but the previous sessions really um, gave us a bit of an idea about 
all the ways in which citizen science and an inclusive one um, is valuable. So, you know, democratizing science, I've got a, a list up there. But I've got a question, which is, um, does citizen science reinforce patterns of exclusion or potentially create new ones? And, um, you know, is it, is it relevant to the communities? And I'm just thinking about my colleague at RMIT who spoke just before the break and, um, you know, what she was interested in versus what partic citizen scientists were interested in were two different things. And I think that's, that's really interesting. You know, how, how relevant is what we're doing? Um, we also know that participation reflects the kind of demographic biases we already have in traditional research. So typically people who are white, educated, middle to upper class. Uh, and so what that means is that there's a lot of people who are missing out. Uh, it means that um, the quality of our projects might not be as good as it could be. We might be excluding some useful, important perspectives and questions, interpretations and experience. And there's also the danger that we're speaking about rather than with marginalized groups. And I think there's some interesting barriers to participation. And on the left, there's some practical ones and on the right, some more philosophical ones. And I think it's the philosophical ones that I'm particularly interested in, although they're all related. There's so much to say in so little time, so forgive me for flying through. Um, so I'm interested in, in the question, is it, is it about how we engage people from marginalized groups in citizen science projects? Is it bringing different people, voices, perspectives, or can research and higher education institutions really hear? Can the academic industrial complex really hear? And um, for many of you who are familiar with uh, First Nations critiques, um, research uh, has been a dirty word, as Linda Tuhiwaiya Smith has spoken about. You know, it's something that uh, has been part of the kind of um, conquest of white settler um, nations. Um, I think we also need to problematize what we think knowledge is and who should have access to that knowledge. And how we think about knowledge is very important. It's not just something out there that can be read about and learned about. It's often embodied, local, lived. What about our power relations with uh, knowledge holders and uh, makes me think of the Jabwaring Embassy, for example, and other kinds of knowledges and practice, for example, Idle No More, Standing Rock, and so on. So I think, you know, my question is diversity and inclusion can be just as extractive and commodifying if Indigenous or First Nations and people of colour uh, are just seen as a gap filler, you know, whether it's theory, data set, or methodology. And there's some things that universities or knowledge producers are not entitled to conquer. So I think instead of thinking of the inclusion question, we need to critically think on how we restructure our normative practices. How do we decenter Western science and institutions as the only places where knowledge is produced or where leadership occurs? So I've outlined the problem and now I'm gonna share some possible solutions. Um, and one of the things I'm very interested in, I know there's a couple of teachers and educators in the, in the rooms, um, but, you know, um, how can we be reflexive about what position we hold in the world? Uh, you know, as someone who maybe works at a university, how do we address disparities in position, access, experience or resources? And Stuart talked about hey, it'd be really great to have some feedback. And it's like, gee, that's, that's the minimum you, should, you know, citizen scientists should have. So who's got the control? How do we show respect, reciprocity, responsibility, respect and safety? I said that twice because respect is so important. How do we listen deeply? How do we honor and value what's shared? Uh, Bonnie has already talked about this. Um, you know, there's also these typologies of uh, shallow and deep kind of ways of engaging with communities, whether, you know, the public or citizen scientists are just data collectors, or do they actually get to design the project and analyze the data? 
So um, here are some ideas from Cheshire. Can we be inclusive, adaptable, sensitive? Can we protect people? How can we be reciprocal in what we do? And um, how do we align research and education? This is another framework from Pandia, which I think is really good. How do we engage with communities throughout? How do we value multiple kinds of knowledge? How do we disseminate widely? And uh, that's something that came up in our breakout room. Um, how do we work with people and become partners in design, implementation and application? I did a project in New Zealand with um, refugee women and a bunch of organisations, community organisations. And one of the things that happened is we spent a year and a half just consulting and talking about how we would do things. Um, I think we've got a lot of structural barriers in a lot of our institutions and systems that mean we can't take the time. We're always in a hurry. We're doing things at the last minute. So I think, you know, the challenge of aligning research and education with what communities want is a really big question. So I'm going to close up with some questions and things just for you to think about. This is from a terrific article, which I'll share in uh, my reference list. But I think these are some really great questions and they come from health. So I know there's quite a few health people here. And I'm just going to go to the next one. I think the trust section at the very bottom is really important around recognizing historical injustices. Structural violence and exclusion and marginalization. So I'm going to conclude. Oh my gosh, with three minutes to spare. I think citizen science is an opportunity to rethink fairness and knowledge production. How do we actually open up the space of science for all? How do I or we act in solidarity with the unequal power relations? And how can we foreground equity and justice in our work? Here are some references, which I'll also share with the, the gang so that you'll have access to them. And I'll probably try and tweet this later too.